everyone. I'm Michelle Bomberger with Equinox Business Law Group. Welcome to our October Equinox Focus event on how to improve 2022 by taking a look at your uh, performance this last year. This last year was a bit of an anomaly, as was the year before. But we look at that performance and we try to figure out what we can do better going into the next year. And, and I'm really uh, pleased and grateful to welcome Doug Hall from Resources for CEOs. Um, Hi, everybody to our program today to kind of help lead the conversation around where we are now and where we're going and how do we achieve that vision uh, for our business. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started um, with the formal program. One, this program is being recorded. It will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel as well as you will get a link um, in a follow-up email. The link will be to that video as well as we'll include the slides. So don't have to frantically take notes. We will provide those slides um, and as well as answering any additional questions. So throughout the program, feel free to drop questions into either the Q&A or the chat. We will try to cover those as best we can during the program. But if not in the follow-up email, uh, we'll try to provide some context there. And of course, both Doug and I are available um, at any time via email to, uh, to follow up um, as well. This will be somewhat of a working session. So there'll be places where we say, kind of pull up this information or you know, reflect on this information. So there will be some, some time for workshopping uh, during the program as well. So we look forward to digging in. Right, and uh, per what Michelle said, you might wanna grab a notebook or a piece of paper and a pencil and be ready to scribble down some notes so you can capture that when it's top of mind. So I'll go ahead and share my screen to get our slide started. Don't wanna kill you guys with PowerPoints, but I think it'll help to keep the flow going. Uh, as Michelle said, we're gonna help you analyze business performance for a better 2022. And with that, we need to look back a little bit and we're also gonna look forward. So uh, looking forward to sharing with you and our contact information is here on the beginning slide and then uh, it's we're easy to get a hold of. So um, I'll sort of lead the, content part of this and Michelle will be color commentating and help us keep on time. We have so much to share with you and want to pack it in, plus give you the reflection time that she mentioned. So be thinking about your business. Where are we now? Where do we go and how to get there? These are the essential questions for business owners and business leaders. The uh, current situation is very challenging still with the economy and uh, coming out of the pandemic. There's lots of external forces and internal forces. We wanna help you think through those. And then we wanna give you a framework. Uh, and this is a framework that Michelle and Kelly, her, her leadership team is very familiar with using this, the whole notion of a leadership and management uh, system that helps you plan for the future. So we're eager to share the content and answer your questions. So the essential beginning question is, where are we now? Uh, what does this year look like year to date? I would challenge you to sort of pull up your financial statements, any KPI records, key performance indicators, uh, think about your industry comparisons because this is the time of year invariably where people call me and they're like, hey, uh, the year is three quarters done, we're in Q4, we're thinking about next year, you know, where do we wanna go? How do we wanna get there? So this, the signposts or the indicators are of course your financial statements, your P&L, your balance sheet. Your top line sales revenue is very important and your key expenses are important. And then your cost of goods is what uh, indicates how you deliver either your product or service. So I would challenge you to uh, pull out the drawer, pull up your another window on your computer and take a look at your financial statements while we're working through these first couple slides. Also, um, many of you have either formal or just in mind key performance indicators or KPIs. These would be usually non-financial measures. So they're not gonna show up on your profit and loss statement. You're not gonna drop them out of QuickBooks or whatever accounting you're using. You're gonna keep track of these indicators separately. So we'll talk about those again in the next slide. So be a good time to pull these numbers out so you can reflect. So another part of where we are now question is, well, what are the drivers in your business? We can have external drivers and we can have internal drivers. The internal drivers are things that are within our control. Either if you're operating at the owner or a leader level, you may be driving behavior in your business, or you may have external factors in the economy, unique to your supply chain, 
lot of challenges on that right now. We can't control the outside world, can we? But we can control our internal drivers if we know them and we choose to control them. So the rhetorical question here, the, the reflection question is, what factors are drivers to power your business? We think about, literally think about your business or your organization having an engine inside it. Well, what, what are the pistons and the gears and the fuel and the air that goes into powering your business? And then if you, if you dissect those, are, can you list them separately and can you track them? Are you tracking them? Could you track them? So a large part of today is look back. But we also wanna be able to give you tools to look forward. So for your reflection in a minute, think about what internal drivers are there. So this leads us to look at this year to date, three quarters plus we're in Q4 with a sort of a gap analysis mindset. Are you satisfied with performance for the year? And, and I'm gonna say specifically, look at your P&L revenue, cost, margin, profit performance. Uh, what, I mean, obviously we would all love more profit, that goes without saying, but, but again, using some judgment, if you could change one or more aspects, what would you change? And, and we naturally then think of number three, are there any troubling performance areas for the internal drivers? Things where your, your spidey senses tell you it's not going right, or your numbers, you're tracking your KPIs and they're not favorable. So grab that scratch pad and reflect on that for a minute. Or two, or three. We'll give you, we'll, we'll be generous with time here. And if you, if you get a brainstorm or have a question and can drop it in the chat or the Q&A, we'll try to call those out as we go along or save them up for the end. Michelle, anything in there that caught your ear that you wanted to highlight? Yeah, I, the things that I often find challenging is something you mentioned on the prior slide, which is you know industry best practices or industry metrics. Um, and I think it's hard to kind of find those sometimes is, you know, is your business the same as other folks? Is your business different? And what are those standards? And, you know, sometimes a CFO um, or someone who's, you know, um, maybe in the M&A space has some insight on what those are to be able to sort of guide whether or not, you know, if, if my profit's not where I want it to be, what are the things that are out of line? Because I may not know that simply as an operator. Yeah, that's a great point. So some sources uh, you guys could think of are, if you're in an industry, where you have an association, bug them. You're paying a membership fee. Say, hey, what comparisons do we have? It's sort of like buying a house. You want the comparables in the neighborhood, right? We want the comparables in our industry. The other thing is you, if you have a fractional CFO or a business acquaintance who's a CFO, ask them if they have access to some kind of industry comparables that you can look at. Yeah, I think and, that's- And someone mentioned the bankers. Bankers also- um, Bankers, yes. Have those as well, so it's great. Bankers often subscribe to industry comparison services. That's that's a great point. So we'll give you guys a minute, a minute or so more to just sort of spend a little bit of time on these questions. Yeah, we may need to up our music game here, Michelle. <laughs> All right, another another uh, few seconds. There you go. There's a timer. All right. We want to back up just so we can reflect on the the prior slide. Yeah, so, so interesting. Yeah, I wonder what, what questions came up for folks. You're welcome to, you know, unmute and, and chat, drop it in the in the chat box. But what were the, the challenges in this gap analysis? What did you what did you have trouble with? What was kind of easy 
easy answer. Number one is kind of a yes or no, maybe, <laughs> or maybe a sort of. I, and I can imagine some people are having a great year and some of you maybe are having really challenging years. Yeah, so the industry metrics question is something that I also struggle with and, and uh, Julie put in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Julie. That it's This is a hard thing. Don't give up. Persist. Keep asking questions. Yeah, and, and I would I would agree that that's often the case. So sometimes you need to take um, when, when Julie mentions that there's not a lot of companies like hers, you know, sometimes you have to figure out like what's an analogous industry. You know, we are sort of deemed a law firm, except we operate more as a consulting firm. So do we look at more of a consulting firm's metrics and maybe compare those to law firms as well, just so that you kind of get the balance of what is what is the same and what is different in them. Um, but yeah, we've had to kind of go outside the box um, as well because of the model that we that we use. Um, yep. Anyone else before we move on? KPIs and core. Okay, so working on KPIs and core financial ratios, Barry, that's a good point. Yeah, and Carol mentioned uh, staffing, and that is absolutely, I think, you know, top of mind for, for many, many, many businesses. You know, and Carol, we're in similar industries, so we have the same the same issue, and it's, it's surprising. Continue to watch the media around, you know, all the people leaving their jobs, yeah, being able to hire is still a challenge, even you know, whether you're whether you're hiring at you know entry level or um, you know professional levels across the board, it's really challenging um, to find people. Yeah, I, I I haven't heard of a single industry or business owner who's saying, oh, I got all the all the applicants I can use. Not at all. We're everybody's struggling for labor right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Those great are good input. shares. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, great input. Thank you. So the big question then is, where do you want to go? And as business owners, busy business owners and leaders, it's easy to focus in on the imperative, the day-to-day, -day, uh, the tactical, if you will, we're going to get to that. But I would encourage you to step back. This is a great time of year in Q4 planning for next year is to step back and figure out, well, where do we want to go? Um, if you have a vision board or a vision plan or any kind of uh, strategic planning, this is a great time to pull it out, blow the dust off of it, and let's take a look at it. Uh, ha have you even written down, and I, I emphasize that, have you gotten out of your head and down on paper where you want to be in, let's say, 10 years, just for rough argument's sake? You may have an inflection point seven years out. You're going to hit a certain age, and you want to be at a certain place. That's, that's great. Um, I then encourage folks to think about the midterm. Three to five years is far enough to be out there, but not so far. So the 10 years, we all, you know, we feel like that's beyond our reach. That's long term. Have you shared any of this vision with your team? Again, as owners, it's easy to think that we've shared it, but I encourage you to explicitly think about sharing your vision. Now, you may want to test your vision uh, to see if it's motivating. You may have a trusted advisor or a lieutenant. And that's great, but getting your vision shared by all is a very powerful internal driver. Remember we mentioned that you control whether you share your vision or not. If you wanna work on your vision, there's some interesting tools and we give you the references uh, in, on the last slide, which you'll get a copy of. Your core ideology is what Jim Collins, the author, researcher, author of Good to Great and all the other books, and the core values, core purpose, and BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal, your future state, probably 10 years out, maybe 15 years out. These are the core of what's inside you as an owner or as a key leader and what you're bringing into the culture and the vision and the future state of your organization. So we would encourage you, and uh, Michelle, we've been involved in doing this some with you and your team. It, it's, it's a very useful activity to get it Get your feelings, get your intentions out of your head and down on paper, get them on a whiteboard, you know, really play with the vision of the future. Because if it's motivating to you, then you want teammates that are going to be motivated by the same vision, right? We don't want divergence of vision. We want people to converge on a future vision. So again, and grab I, your note, grab your notepad. Yeah, add to that. Yeah, I was just gonna add, you know, I um, if you haven't read Jim Collins, Good to Great, um, it, it's definitely worth a read. If you read it a while ago, 
it's also worth rereading because um, your brain is in a different place in your business now than it was maybe the first time you read it. I remember, you know, BHAG being this thing that was like, yeah, great in concept, but, you know, that's for bigger companies. That's for other companies. That's for, I'm not there yet. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, if you kind of go back and, and think about it in a different light, in a different mindset, um, it resonates differently. So these concepts are used, you know, pretty consistently across small businesses to big businesses. And whether you call it a BHAG or you call it a vision, um, really just having something that's, that's that close your eyes. What does your business look like at that point in time? What does your life look like? Because I think that's a big part of, of what we often overlook as entrepreneurs is this, you know, the, the, the business is not all of it. The, the life is definitely all of it, um, with the business sort of included and sometimes not. So what does that 10-year vision look like for you? And, and, and kind of close your eyes and envision what you look like as well as what the business looks like. My encouragement is that you make the 10-year vision one or maybe two sentences, just as simplified as you can make it, and make it a future state of being, not how you're going to get there, but what what's it going to be like when you get there? So a desired future state. And then the three to five-year vision can be more elaborate, more explain more, more details, because it's really always just over the horizon. Three years is not very long, very far away. So take another minute or two, capture a few notes on that, uh, pick some numbers, maybe a certain number of employees, a certain number of locations, a certain number of product lines, um, a certain number of salespeople, a certain number of delivery service, uh, if you know any kind of metric that helps you get the future in mind and bring it to the present so people can share that vision with you be very it's very useful and again as top leaders we assume we say it once and they remember it how many times do we need to say things to our kids for them to for, to get through okay i know about 100 right but it's really seven right scientifically we know if you say something seven times it's really going to get through so Nobody will ever quit your organization because you share your vision too much. Trust me. Also make a little plug for core values. A word or two or a short phrase that describes what's important to you and that points to human behavior can be an, a very effective if you share your core values with potential employees it will act as a it will act as a magnet to pull in the right people and like an electromagnet it will push away the people that really don't fit in your organization so i really encourage you to work on core values jim uh, jim collins and patrick lencioni marvelous work on helping you to clarify your core values and your core purpose So a little teaser there, we're going to get into strategy and tactics next. So this is bringing your vision down to ground. So don't get too hung up on how you get to your vision, just capture what you want the future to be. Another 30 seconds to capture your thoughts here. Don't judge your vision. Get it out. It's it's floating around in your head. Put it down on paper and look at it and say, wow, I didn't know I wanted that. Yeah, Michelle, yeah, so, you may. Yeah, I would say a few other few other resources. Um, Barry just mentioned Simon Sinek, who I think is you know genius. 
Um, and Doug mentioned Patrick Lencioni. One of uh, the books that I found really, really valuable is The Five uh, Dysfunctions of a Team, um, mm. which was just a really good, easy read about how you know teams engage with each other. Um, yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, and Lencioni has a number of, of really, really good, good books. He also wrote a summary book a few years ago called The Advantage, which turns all of his allegories into sort of a textbook. So, nice. yeah. It's, so, it's, what, so just from your, from your reflections on vision, I, I imagine many of you have done some exercise like this, um, whether it was a few months ago, a few years ago. Um, you know, what was, what was easy and what was challenging about this exercise? Is it hard to think about where you're going to be in 10 years? Some of you may want to retire and you got to think about, does your business or your practice carry on without you? It can feel overwhelming. I think that's, that's a good, good word. Like where do you yeah. start? Which is what, hopefully where we're going to go next is to say, you know, how do we bring this down to today? Um, because you can sort of look out there and you know into the future and say, yeah, magically I'm going to get there. But uh, the how do I how do I bring this back to what I should be doing today? I think is one of the, the most difficult parts. Anyone else? Other insights? Perry's always full of, of good quips. <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Yep, thank you, Barry, that's true. So with this vision work, it's really saying, hey, I wanna go there, now what path am I gonna take to get there? It can be amazing how circuitous the path can be, but if you lay your future out there, it's surprising how many people get to their future. So please take this homework. <laughs> Do some more. Would, it won't hurt you to do more. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, it's it's, I, and I, I use the word easy kind of lightly, but it's it's easy to kind of just do the business every day, right? Kind of go in, just show up, do the work, do the work that needs to be done. Um, and I think to Barry's point, you know, you'll go somewhere, right? Um, and and I, I reflect on this for many 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 years of my own business, you know, not really having um, like you know having some numbers and having some you know, but nothing that was truly. I would say vision and destination. Um, and this kind of work, I think, really does ground the process, not only for you, but for your team to then be able to say, what is important right now? Um, you know, we implemented um, EOS, which Doug is, is uh, really familiar with and has helped us with. That's the entrepreneur operating system. And just the structure of a place and time and, and, and structure to work on these things makes a difference. Yeah, sort of a cadence, a repeating cadence, right? We'll get more into that. Any other thoughts, shares? All right, moving right along to the how to, how do we do this? So if, if the vision is the what in the future, the strategy is how, how are we gonna get there? So a little bit of a tutorial here and then an ability to reflect on it. Uh, I believe these are great. These six or seven things or eight things are, are elements of strategy. And you would say, when people say, what's your strategy? You kind of look at them quizzically like, like, what do you mean? Well, I think all of these bullets aggregate into your strategy. So if you've never been able to define that before, you'll have this definition to work with. So it's your brand. It's your product service offering and how you deliver it. It's your value proposition, which has a lot to do with pricing relative to the product service offering. Your target market, like who's our bullseye, to, to quote my friend Barry Zimmerman, what's your bullseye customer or client? You know, who's the perfect fit for your service? And then like an archery target, there's other rings. So if you're aiming at a market, what does it look like? How big is it? Where is it? Your competitive positioning and differentiation. You know, you fit in with others doing similar things. Very few of us have completely 100% different businesses. So how do we bring our uh, competitiveness and differentiation to the market in a way that works for us? And folks would say that 
that's wrapped up in your business model. No time for that today, but your strategy is a key part of your business model. The words you own, you, you, you may think about trademarking some words, right? Talk to Michelle and her team about that for advice on, is this, is this a word I really own? Is there a special way I do things? Your brand promises are what you convey to the market saying, hey, if, if you come to me and I serve you and you give me money, I'll give you this service or this product. It's wrapped up within your brand. And then last but not least, your strategy usually works itself out through marketing and sales to that target market so that you can then deliver your product or service. The key question and for reflection as we go through this, how's your strategy working? I, I recap these elements here so you can reflect on it and make some notes. Are there warning signs in your sales and marketing machinery? Um, will you, if your strategy worked in 2021, will it continue to work in 2022? Maybe you were forced into key strategy changes during beginning of COVID 2020 that you've now perfected during 2021. Are they still gonna work next year? Questions. They, this is why you, why you own the, and drive the business. You're, you're all leaders and advisors, so think through this. So take a minute and comment, hey, do I have any weak spots in here? Do I have any outstanding strengths in here that we could leverage even more? So Doug, something I would, I would also maybe add or, or ask you, um, it seems that, that strategy includes an operational aspect as well. This is really focused on sales and marketing, but the way that you um, run your business is part of the strategy as well, I would think. So um, the, the process I, is, I, yeah. I think it's that third bullet, bullet, Michelle, your product service creation, manufacturing, delivery of the product or service to the market is, is that part, is a key part of strategy. It is the, in essence, the delivery of your strategy. If you're just selling and marketing air, might, might not be much of a market for that. You gotta <laughs> right, actually deliver something. So, so yeah, but then we don't wanna forget those other elements of your strategy. How do you communicate it? How do you price it? Where are you positioned? How do you differentiate? All of that goes into what people would say is, if, you, if you're in the Seattle startup community, people bandy this around, what's your strategy? And what they're asking you is sort of a question of what's your business model? What's your product service offering? How do you go to market? What do your channels look like? All those things are when people use the word strategy, that's generally the way I unpack it. So that the how you do it. And then I think that's also really important from, you know, how do you tell the story internally and externally, right? Very so you important. Have, you know, your, your team and what are we measuring? We talked at the beginning about what are we measuring and we'll get back to that here in a minute. Um, and why are we measuring it, right? The reason that, you know, any given company, our company um, performs the way it does and has the customers that we have is because we do things a certain way. And it's important that we do things a certain way because that's what differentiates us from other people. Um, so that internal, you know, communication of the strategy is also, I think, really, really important. You mentioned communication of the vision. I think the communication of the strategy is also, um, is also important. Absolutely. And, and since we're all looking for people, the most important marketing you'll do right now is for new employees. So getting your vision out there, getting your strategy out there is like, hey, this is what we are. This is the way we do it. Michelle at Equinox has a very specific model for general counsel service that's different from the normal law firm. That doesn't mean the normal law firm is wrong. It just means that Michelle and her team have found a different way and a target market that appreciates that and gets more value out of it. That, that's a great example of pure strategy. What Michelle and her team have done with general counsel is a great example. And it's a challenge, right, Michelle? Because not everybody wakes up in the morning saying, oh, I'm gonna go get a new general counsel service today, right? right? But once they hear about it and you explain the value prop and the difference, they're like, oh, I never thought about that. That's intriguing. It's more work, but you probably can deliver more value and hopefully yield a, a greater profit margin by bringing out value for your client. And then I would add just to that that, um, you know, Andy mentioned earlier, you know, overwhelming and, you know, it doesn't end. 
this is not a kind of a one and done process. This is something that, that is ongoing, constantly changing, which makes it somewhat overwhelming because you feel like, do I have time to go through this again? Do I, you know, do we have to go through this again? And ultimately it is the core to growth. It's the core to staying in touch with your market. Um, and so it doesn't end. So, you know, you know, Doug mentions, you know, we, we have this, this model and we're really kind of continuing to work it and morph it and communicate it and change it. And, you know, it's never done, um, which is the unfortunate part because <laughs> it'd be nice for it to be done. Um, but it's also, you know, how, how we compete, how you compete, um, all of you as, as participants here, you know, understanding who your customers are, understanding how the market is changing um, and staying staying on top of that. You wanna give them a couple minutes to-, to Yep, yeah, let's take another minute or two, capture your thoughts, any gaps here, any strengths here. And just a reminder, we are going to send you guys copies of the slides and the resources, the fact that help help you with self-study afterwards. So don't feel like you have to capture every single word here. We want you really to take what's in your head and get it down on your notes. I think to Andy's question about um, you know good to great applying to solopreneurs. Um, yeah, I think every business needs these tools kind of in their, their tool chest. And so thinking about these concepts um, is important. And they're, they're not all gonna be applicable if the intent is that you will always be just you, um, because you're not gonna have who's sitting in the right seat on the bus and all of those different concepts that, that kind of flow from um, much of these, these materials. But I think certainly the grounding in you know, vision strategy tactics, whether you're using something like traction, which is, you know, the, the EOS methodology or scaling up or, you know, good to great, you know, there's, there's so many, um, but just thinking about them and putting them in the context of your world, I think is, is valuable regardless of the size of the business. Um, there's also things like the Rockefeller habits, um, which is, you know, how, how are you aligned with respect to your you know, your vision strategy tactics as well. So there's, there's lots of tools yep. out there that are, that are valuable. And I always find that, you know, maybe not one thing, but one thing added to another thing that you can start to say, oh, those two things together really make sense. Um, I, I think if you're a business owner, if you're not an employee, then all of this work applies to you. But like Michelle said, if you're not building a staff of other employees, then some of the pieces don't fit. Also, each of these authors has other works like Jim uh, Collins has Beyond Entrepreneurship, which was his first book about small business. And now he's just released Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. So if you Google up Jim Collins, you'll see his whole bibliography. And oftentimes you can dip in and out of it with a book summary, you know, and just get it really quick. You don't have to wade through 250 pages. The other one uh, that just reminded me of is The E-Myth. Um, oh, email, that's a classic, a classic. Yep. for smaller, smaller companies sort of looking at, you know, in being in the business, being working on the business, that's a kind of classic, you know, comparison. Um, but that book is, is, is good foundation, I think, for how to think about where you are today and where you want to be going. I totally agree. So once we're clear about vision and strategy, we're sort of rolling down the hill. Do you want to get any, any feedback oh. on strategy? Do we? Yeah. Anybody have something to share out or one more comment or question? All right. I want to make sure we got an opportunity to have that. Yep. Perfect. So what do we do to get there? So if, if vision is where and strategy is how, then tactics are what? What are we going to do? And by the way, we live in the tactical world every day. 
So this is the most familiar territory. But I'd like to raise the, your sights just a little bit to think about tactical management and tactical execution. So think back over the year, how did it go? Do you have any kind of intermediate planning meetings during the year? Uh, did you at the beginning of the year state what you wanted in financial results, revenue, profit, cash, uh, any goals during the year? For example, a goal could be a new, a new initiative. Like we wanna upgrade our main software or we wanna introduce a new product line or a new service, right? What, what intermediate goals did you have during the year to help you have a successful year? How do you feel about accountability in yourself? Sometimes it's self accountability, sometimes it's your team. Even if you have contractors, 1099s, where are you on expectation of other people executing and their accountability? This is everyday management of the business. Julie had a great comment kind of wrapping out on strategy. <laughs> Getting off, I'll mention this as a best practice in a few minutes, getting off site for the strategy work, strongly recommend. Yeah, so I just how's, commented that I, I always appreciate having somebody else there to reflect on because the sitting, the sitting in the room and um, thinking, you know, I need some sort of framework or some sort of, you know, and someone to bounce ideas off of. So I have a, a harder time being completely alone in doing it. Um, and and I've, I've said for, for years, like no one tells you how to be a CEO, right? You know, you, you start this nope. business, great idea, place in the market. And, um, you know, you just sort of start the wheels turning and it's easy to do the work. It's easy to sort of answer emails. It's easy to, you know, get, get into that, that cadence. But then you're like, well, what does it mean to, to be a CEO? And that's what this stuff really is. And finding this, the, the space, both time and um, mind share that, you can really put the work into this it makes a huge difference in your ability to sort of drive the ship in the right direction. Absolutely. So how about some actions? Uh, if, if we were, if we have a gap for 2021, what could we do to close the gap for 2022, given we've got two and a half more months or so to, to get ready for next year? Well, my, Action recommendation number one is make a simple written one-year plan. And the two key elements of a simple written one-year plan are to set metrics. So measurables, KPIs, objectives, there's different ways of saying it, but numbers that tell you a story. And some of them are financial results like P&Ls. Some of them are like cash. Some of them are leading indicators like number of new clients, customer win numbers or percentages, customer client retention, things like net promoter score so that you can get from your clients or customers, would they recommend you to somebody else? All of these can be key metrics. And if you think about them going into the year saying, hmm, how'd we do in 2021? What do we want to do for 2022? You're setting benchmarks for yourself. You're literally putting marks on the bench saying, end of Q1, end of Q2, three, four, Next year, we're gonna do this amount. At least that's your plan, that's your intention. Uh, you gotta be ready to react though, just like, uh, who is it that Mike Tyson, who says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So that's what running a business is all about, right? So how about we also define some goals? We would like to do some new things next year. I call them strategic initiatives. They usually involve new capabilities, extended capacities, like we want to double our plant, or key accomplishments. We want to win our hundredth client or whatever. Usually it's not the measures, it's not the metrics. It's usually a project, a capacity, or a new capability. Um, looks like we got a comment. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I just like the inclusiveness of that, that you know, the team must feel really valued because you went out of your way to, to make sure that their voices are included in something that's really important to the organization. That's great. And, and if you have, if you're solo or have two or three people or a small team, probably if you have less than 10 employees, you may want to find a way to do this planning inclusively, even though some of your employees may struggle 
thinking at a strategic level for a half a day or a whole day, try to give them space to get their ideas. People love to be heard. Trust me, you can't listen too much. Please remember that. Two ears, one mouth. As owners and leaders, we oftentimes flip that around. We talk too much and don't listen enough. So this planning process, if you can go offline to Michelle's point, if you can get your top leaders involved, if you have a bigger team, get everybody involved, maybe do some pre-planning with your top lieutenant or top advisor, and then have another two hour session with your whole team to get everybody on board as what are the metrics, what are the goals for 2022? Another set of practices you can think about, and then I'll, I'll kind of go back and forth as you'd wish between metrics, goals, and then four key best practices. Um, hitting the right numbers is, is a phrase I like to use. It's choosing appropriate KPIs and objectives. You can't choose everything. You can overwhelm yourself with numbers. Try to say, remember, less is more. If you had five to 10 key measures that would reflect on your internal drivers that we talked about early in the slides. Put them down, put some goals and levels down for those numbers and create accountability, give ownership to the right people in your team. Weekly meetings that are effective, quarterly planning sessions, Michelle alluded to this, the ability to get offline and if, if it's affordable in your budget, even hire a facilitator to help you come in and run the planning meetings quarterly. And then strive for consistency of execution. Your core processes and your standard operating procedures documented and followed by all your people is a really great thing to aim for. And you might want to aim for it within this year. You might want to aim for within three years. But I think hitting the right numbers is the way we run our business every week, every month, every quarter. Weekly meetings for accountability and check-ins. I've got some, there's some great agendas in the in the reference books, Traction and, and Rockefeller Habits are, and Scaling Up all have great outlines for meetings. Michelle, what, what about some of our chats? Um, you mean in the chat box? Yes. Yeah, no, I think, you know, there's a couple comments from from Carol about just, you know, how to, how to um, I think, find that that mind space because yes. you have a lot of repetition and, and um, easy to kind of go through the routine of the day. Um, and changing that dynamic is easy for some people and really difficult for others. A um, couple of things I wanted to just, you know, mention on um, your slide here is the, the KPIs is, is an interesting point because I feel that there's, there's a need for them to be one measurable for the business's success and to align with the strategy and the vision, um, but also be something that motivates the team. You know, something that we noticed was the things we were measuring and talking about weren't the things that that people could connect to the vision. And so they were important metrics, but they weren't motivating and they weren't they, they weren't connected to where we were going from a strategy standpoint. Um, so for instance, you know sales um, sales numbers, you know, we got to watch it. There's no question that most businesses need to watch top line sales and bottom line profit. But is that really the number that we want to focus on in the day-to-day -day conversations with the team? So I think that's uh, that was something that really kind of stood out to me. And then I think the, the consistent execution, you know, most of us are not really into and excited about writing process. It's just not something that one, we either have time for or that we have a particular interest in, yet we know it's important. So how, how do you find that time or find the right people to help get at least some basic processes started um, that you can then build upon slowly or, or find a way to get that? Because that is really a huge part of, um, being able to scale and execute. Um, you look at a franchise, for instance, what are they selling? They're selling the fact that they've already built out the whole thing the way it works. Yeah. Um, and you know, if it's only in your head or only in the head of a couple of people, then new people who come on board um, kind of have to learn you know, by watching rather than learn by structure. And the more structure, the easier it is for that to happen. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that particularly that last one, consistent execution. I have clients that often put that in as a goal for the whole year and maybe not even to get processes and procedures for the whole company, just sections of the organization. So be careful. Uh, how do you eat an elephant? Elephant one bite at a time, right? Don't you, you 
don't overwhelm yourself because remember there's a business to run every day so that's why i said set quarterly rocks that the metaphor from stephen covey on rocks is all about managing your time chipping away at your 2022 goals if you put your goal out for the whole year every quarter if you do planning you'll be able to look at your goals and say hmm what are we going to attack this quarter what's right for this quarter not too much not too little again every 90 days is long enough but it's short enough you can recover on that 90th day with your next off site and say wow we were off target here or we really did a good work we got ahead of our game whatever it is i suggest you adjust every 90 days by doing that off site could be two hours could be four hours some teams use a whole day off site there's been a bit of a bit of conversation in here about um, eos traction um, and it is, it's a really good methodology um, for smaller companies, I think, very practical. Um, as I mentioned, you, um, Doug has helped us implement, implement it in our business. Um, and there's a few things that, you, that are aligned with what's on this list that are or what it really provides. It provides structure for this, which, again, as I mentioned, for me, that's a huge, huge help because it's so easy just to jump into the routine of the day and not do the things that are really important. So. The other thing I'll say, because I've been involved in the EOS world for uh, as a professional for over five years, it's to my reckoning, and I've studied all the leadership and management systems out there, it's the only system with enough infrastructure, enough books, enough support systems for you to do it yourself. Now, do I recommend EOS traction or anything do it yourself? Well, if you can hire a guide, if you're going to go on a hiking thing to the top of Rainier, if you can do it yourself, that's great. A lot of people would hire a guide. So my encouragement to you and in the resource list is like, don't hold back because you can't afford help, but there's plenty of resources for you to tap into. And there is always extra help. I I'm happy to answer questions anytime. Drop me an email or give me a call to, because I love just seeing business owners get closer to that vision they want, right, Michelle? I mean, that's, that's really what it's about. It's just seeing you, Kelly, and your team drive Equinox forward uh, it, 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 to me, it's, it's very compelling. It's, it's my work. That's what I do. So sharing these best practices with you today is a way for me to share with you, hey, you can do this, um, but don't expect to do it all in one, one and done, <laughs> right? This is, this is not like the drive through at uh, In-N-Out Burger. You, know, you, you got to keep going back, going back, keep working this and expect it to be a journey, not just a seminar. Right. It's not just read traction and poof, everything's better. Right, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. Take, Again, it you is. Gotta stay with it. It's the cadence. But I, I do think that, you know, Julie mentions about, you know, self implantation and it's, it's definitely, um, definitely doable. And I think it's, it is taking it, you know, step by step and understanding what the purpose is of it and why it's applied the way it is. Um, you know, the, accountability that it provides. And I think even more than that, the fact that there are the same conversations happening with people at the same time. So it's it, what one of the things that we found, again, this goes to the process piece as well as the planning piece, is that there's a lot less of the, hey, I had this idea. Hey, what about this? Hey, you know, but really putting it into one place and applying yep. it to strategy on a regular basis yep. and really sort of connecting those dots all the time. So the other thing we should mention, there are a couple of software packages available um, and my favorite is called 90.io to run your EOS, whether you're self-implementing or working with a coach, it really doesn't matter. So this is, you know, this, this program is not about, you know, not about EOS. We've talked about a number. No, of we're not trying to sell EOS, but yeah, tools out there. EOS is really popular right now, which is why, you know, Carol mentioned that numerous people have mentioned traction. It's just a really popular tool right now, but these concepts are available in, in lots of different, um, lots of different structures and lots of different materials, which, uh, Doug's provided a, a good list of resources at the end um, to cover it. So, um, you know, pick your poison, but stick with it and you know, dig in with these concepts in mind. Absolutely. How do we ensure we're gonna get to that future we want? I mean, what are the risks out there? Who could have two years plus ago, who could have predicted we were running into COVID-19, right? Uh, what could derail your plan? We can't imagine the unimagined, but we can look at risk factors that are out there. We can also look at our own gaps. Uh, what would you put in place to manage those gaps? 
uh, building systems and processes, like Michelle mentioned a minute ago, it can take years to get what you want. Uh, and my encouragement to you is just don't stop. The number one thing of being an entrepreneur is don't stop. Keep going. Uh, a couple other resource ideas is tap on your trusted advisors, your other business owner friends, CFOs, attorneys, business coaches, folks are out there to answer questions and help you and they're not necessarily going to hold their hand out for a fee if you need formal help from folks sure get it get a statement of work maybe engage them maybe not consider joining a group like entrepreneurs organization or vistage or excel or convene all of these are active in the greater seattle area now uh, the women presidents organization women's business owners i mean the list goes on and on and on right uh, you will get value from being in a peer group of other owners and leaders. And then what we've talked about with EOS and Rockefeller Habits and scaling up and 40X and great game of business and on and on are leadership and management operating systems. They're books and blueprints created by the researchers and authors and then brought forward in popular systems explained in books that you can do yourself or you can hire some folks to get you help. But Think for a minute, what risks did you see coming through 2021? What threatened you? What's out there that might be bugging you? Write it down, because if you socialize with other people, they may have an answer for you that is not coming out of your own brain. You don't have to live with the risk by yourself. And this is um, this is kind of my my world, so I get I get kind of excited about this this space because. One of the things that I think entrepreneurs, um, you know, tend to gloss over a little bit is what are the things that could go wrong and what are the risk factors that you're accepting, whether that's in contracts or whether that's in hiring, um, whether that's in, you know, expansion plans, all of those things, you know, have these risk factors that often aren't really dug into much. And we talk a bit about um, the three, what I call the three key tools of, of um, risk mitigation. You've got your contracts, which you hope insulate your whatever that relationship is you hope it provides the rules to insulate that if something goes wrong here's the steps that we take because that's what the contract says and here's the maximum liability i have and if that doesn't cover whatever that risk is then you look to your insurance and you say okay do i have insurance that protects against this and sometimes you do sometimes you don't um, sometimes you have the contract and the insurance those two things work together and sometimes they work separately and then you know worst case scenario you know you've got an entity structure that protects your personal assets from risks to the business. So with those three tools, you know, evaluating the relationships in your business, um, the risks in your business and saying, which of those tools applies to this particular scenario? Do I need a contract that does, that protects, you know, my IP? Do I need a contract that, you know, limits my liability if something goes wrong? Um, do I have enough insurance to cover the, you know, potential, um, outside of my control, external factors, external drivers that could disrupt my business. Um, and am I signing personal guarantees? Am I putting myself intentionally on the hook for liabilities? Or can I rely on that entity to be my, the barrier between the business and, and my person? So those are just a couple of, a couple of tools um, for you to keep in mind. I should have put the chart in here that kind of shows those three things um, for, for your thinking. But that's how I would really look at risk factors what are the relationships what are the things we're doing and which of those three tools can we apply and the systems and the processes are a lot around those tools right do we have processes to make sure our contracts are reviewed and cover the right things um, do we have insurance that covers the right things as we move into different parts of our business or as we acquire additional assets or invest in additional infrastructure so a couple of other notes there that that you know may trigger some thoughts on the risk and mitigation side yeah, that's great stuff. I mean, a lot of times we tend to be very much glass half full optimistic people and we really need to keep risk in mind and use those three buffers that Michelle talked about to to manage our risk. Yeah, do you want to take a couple, one minute to just give people a chance to think about that? Yep. And then we'll get toward the, uh, the wrap up. We're running out of time here. Yep, we're heading into the end. Great questions and and uh, sharing today. Look forward to sending out the recaps to you guys. So keep an eye on your email.
Okay, any thoughts on this topic? Any questions, uh, things that sort of came to mind as you were thinking about risk and mitigation? All right, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. So I wanted to first just say thanks to Doug for joining us today and bringing like all of his many, many, many years of knowledge and research and study on this topic. Um, so I appreciate that. He's definitely available to uh, answer any questions. Um, I'm certainly happy to, to give you my two cents as well. I'm definitely not as studied on these topics, but more of a, um, you know, lessons learned approach uh, here. We also have uh, listed here our upcoming focus events. For those of you who are not um, on our newsletter list, you are uh, welcome to, to join that. Um, and you can get this information uh, in your inbox. We have an upcoming program on November the 17th that was just added. A um, friend of mine, uh, Andrea Houston, is doing a um, talk on gratitude. So the three key steps to creating a life of opportunity and grace, which I think will be just amazing to hear, especially in the middle of November. Good time to sort of you know, ground mm. ourselves in where we want to be personally and, and what we what we. Uh, should feel gratitude for. And then December 2nd is our standard annual year in review trends for 2022. So we will kind of share a bit about what's changed in the legal landscape. There's a few things beyond COVID, um, just FYI, and what you should be thinking about from a legal perspective on uh, 2022 business planning. Both of those are available on our website, uh, equinox.law under the events tab. Perfect. And hey, Andrea Houston's got a great story and that, that November 17th will be a great session. Make it if, live if you can. So we would love to have, slide. say again? I want to just pop up that last slide just so they can see kind of this is, this yeah. is, you know, will be again in the materials that we send out afterwards. Um, we would love your feedback and questions afterwards to Michelle or myself or both of us. This is just a reference slide. We mentioned the, the Vern Harnish Rockefeller book, uh, Rockefeller Habits and Scaling Up with Traction in the Middle. A cool one by Han Cameron Harrell called vision, Vivid Vision is a great encouragement to get your vision out of your head and down on paper. And then for that strategy, go to market work, building a story brand by Donald Miller is my, my standard go-to recommendation. It's yeah. right, Michelle, you love that too, right? Yeah, fabulous. For, we mentioned templates and tools or we, we implied that somebody asked a question about quarterly agendas, scalingup.com, eosworldwide.com, and jimcollins.com are three places you can go with these menu clicks. Um, DIY EOS is very possible. I lead a self-implementer peer group. I'd love to have you as, a, as my guest in a future month. It's two hours on Zoom, people helping each other self-implement. It's a thing. Uh, talk with somebody, I'll answer questions. I'll introduce you to my friends in this world. Michelle works on this herself. With, scaling up experience and EOS. So, hey, ask questions. That's what we're here for. Love to help you guys. Uh, my email's on there. You got Michelle's email from the uh, from the newsletter list. We're just su super grateful to have you here today and it's been fun. Michelle, it's always fun to talk with you. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate you joining us. Look forward to seeing you at a future event and have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, you guys.